Uh, all right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Webinar Wednesday with the American Anthropological Association and the Department of Veterans Affairs. Today's uh, webinar will be recorded, um, so feel free to um, enjoy it later in the week. Uh, we will be accepting questions through the chat box and the Q&A tab. Um, chat box is probably better for technical questions, whereas Q&A will be um, better for the Q&A section at the end. Uh, in case you're having any technical difficulties, um, be sure to do a speaker microphone audio test. Uh, you will not need the microphone today, but the, the speaker, it helps to sync uh, with WebEx. Um, we should have some time for questions at the end, so um, feel free to ask a question at any point during the conversation, and we'll address it um, at the tail end. Um, let's see. All right. Um, today, uh, we are exploring the anthropological work done at the Department of Veterans Affairs with Kenda Stewart, um, Heather Riesinger, and uh, David Katz. Uh, and let's see, a brief introduction of the three. Um, Kenda is an anthropologist and qualitative analyst for the Central for Comprehensive Access and Delivery Research and Evaluation. The Veterans Rural Health Resource Center Central Region and the VISN 23 Patient Aligned Care Team. Uh, demonstration lab located in Iowa City. Heather is an anthropologist and investigator at CADRA and the assistant professor in the General Internal Medicine Division in the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of Iowa. And David is a core investigator in CADRA Center and the associate professor of medicine and epidemiology at the University of Iowa in Iowa City. Uh, and without further ado, I turn it over to you, uh, Kenda. Thanks, Andrew. Um, first, I'd like to thank you for organizing this and to thank the American Anthropological Association for inviting us to do this webinar. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to Unanthropologetically Working Together, Mixed Methods Collaboration and Health Services Research at the Department of Veteran Affairs. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Heather Riesinger. Thanks, Kenda. Um, so, as we have to start all of our presentations, I just want to make sure you are aware that um, the opinions we express here are those of ourselves and not the federal government or the Department of Veterans Affairs. So, I'm going to be talking about the growth of anthropology of anthropologist in the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, a former boss of mine, when I told him about a new hire um, in another VA, uh, said to me, you guys are multiplying like rabbits. Um, there's been a rapid increase of anthropologists in the VA um, in less than a decade. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit, as well as kind of give an overview of the VA. So I'll talk about who is the VA, the role of research, the growth of anthropology, and then um, specifically uh, our qualitative core at CADRE to give you a little bit of local context as well. So the mission statement of the Department of Veterans Affairs is to fulfill President, President Lincoln's promise to care for him that shall have borne the battle for his widow and his orphan by serving and honoring the men and women for American veterans. So it's a pretty hefty mission statement. I also include it because it links um, the Department of Veterans Affairs work back to the Civil War where a lot of the institutional structure that is still with us today um, began. Um, so 
The Department of Veterans Affairs is an executive at the executive branch level, so we have a secretary that sits on President Obama's cabinet. Um, his name is Bob, um, Bob McDonald, um, and he's fairly recently appointed, if you have been following what's been going on in the Veterans Affairs. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is that the Department of Veterans Affairs is divided into three administrations. Um, the ones that we're most familiar with are probably veteran benefits. So similar to Social Security Administration, for example, they make decisions on the level of disability of veterans who apply um, for benefits through the Department of Veterans Affairs. There's the National Cemetery Administration, and then the Veterans Administration Health, which is probably what most people know the VA for, and that is the administration that takes care of all the hospitals and clinics throughout the United States. So most anthropologists in the VA work for the Veterans Health Administration. Um, it provides integrated health care to veterans, um, and I also want to point out that it's different from the Department of Defense's military treatment facility. So those hospitals and clinics that are on military bases. Um, the Veterans Health Administration serves um, people who are not actively in the military, but were formerly. It's also the largest integrated healthcare system, the largest healthcare safety net, and trains the most medical professionals in the United States. So it's a large healthcare system that provides a lot of services in the United States um, in many different ways, including education. Um, it is divided into 22 different regions, which we call Veteran Integrated Service Networks or VISNs. There are 150 VA medical centers with, um, divided up into these regions. And those VA medical centers are the hospitals that most people are aware of. There are also nearly 1,400 outpatient clinics and long-term care facilities um, that are linked with these VA medical centers. There are 53,000 uh, licensed healthcare practitioners serving 8.3 million veterans currently. And these services include primary and specialty care, mental health, chronic care management, telemedicine, among many other services. And then the Veterans Health Administration also includes research. But before I move into that, uh, we have a question for the audience. Um, are there any veterans att attending today's webinar? We'll take a few seconds to see answers for that. Just for ease of use, if anyone wants to, uh, they can raise their hand, uh, click yes, no, or um, any of the other options available. It looks like people are chiming in. Um, and I'll, I'll tally these answers uh, as they come in more. Um, but yeah, uh, feel free to continue on. Yeah, it looks like we have uh, three or looks like we have three or four uh, veterans in the audience. Um, yeah, no, it, I, as I said. Um, Looks so, like we have uh, uh, three or four uh, veterans um, attending today. Yeah. So, um, moving to the. Uh, it sounds like you're cutting out a little bit, uh, Kenda. Yep. No, so are you. <laughs> That's not good. Can you hear me better now? That sounds great. Thank you. OK. So um, research at the VA is divided into four different groups. There's the Biomedical Laboratory Research and Development Service, the Clinical Science Research and Development Service. And then the one that most um, anthropologists in the VA work for is the Health Services Research and Development Service, HSR&D, uh, which also has the Quality Enhancement Research in this Initiative, which is called QUERY. 
um, health services research um, is really about looking at access to health care, costs, and outcomes with the main goal um, to identify the most effective ways to organize, manage, finance, and deliver um, high quality care, reduce medical errors, and improve patient safety. And that's from the Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality, which is ARC, um, and they're one of the other major funders of health services research besides the VA. There's also the Rehabilitation Research and Development Service, which several um, anthropologists in the VA work with that service as well. So very broadly, um, VA has uh, research in the VA is, um, there's a lot of research going on in the VA. It has been for quite some time and has made a huge impact on medical um, and healthcare in the United States or throughout the world, I should say. Um, including the development of pacemakers and CAT scans. Uh, the VA had the first successful liver transplant, helped develop the nicotine patch, um, identified the gene associated with the major risk for schizophrenia, and then one in health services research is barcode medication administration. Um, so those barcodes that are on medicines and being able to scan the patient's armband and making sure for patient safety reasons that they receive the right medication. So, so enter, enter anthropologists. Um, as I've said, there's increasing number, it's primarily in research, and really it's been spurred by a growing interest in process, context, and stakeholder perspectives. So um, helping understand through ethnographic methods uh, the process of a medical intervention, how it's working, the setting it's working in, and, and then really getting at different people's perspectives on how it's working, whether it's working well, why it's not working well, if it's not, um, those types of questions. And that's really spurred the growth of anthropologists working in the VA to answer these questions. Um, some other roles that anthropologists play are in patient and staff education, uh, patient safety more broadly um, on the operation side of things or in hospitals and clinics, and then with special populations, for example, rural veterans. There are approximately 75 um, in the VA Google, anthropology Google group, so that might be an over approximation of how many anthropologists are in there. but that's the group that is networked um, to talk about anthropological issues uh, in the VA. And then about 18 VA medical center, uh, centers have anthropologists that we are aware of. So another quick question, um, um, how many of you are government employed anthropologists? Looks like we have uh, three here. Okay. That's great. Several of our colleagues, I see. <laughs> Four, okay. actually. I'm going to move on. Maybe. Okay, and then lastly, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the qualitative core here at Iowa City um, in Cadre. Um, it started in 2006 with one anthropologist, which was myself, um, hired as a qualitative um, staff person to help on different projects and help develop um, qualitative components on different projects. Uh, currently, we have four PhD anthropologists um, who serve in investigator and data analyst roles. We have a cultural geographer who we um, think of as an anthropologist, um, but she makes sure we know she's a geographer. Uh, we have one uh, master's level sociologist and master's of public health, and then uh, we have a qualitative core manager who really organizes and makes sure the work gets done, helps with budgeting of the work um, and assigning tasks. 
We have a research coordinator specifically for qualitative research who helps with IRBs and things like that. And then what's really helped us is we have three in-house transcribers right now. Um, that number fluctuates. But with all of the data security issues that we have in the VA, um, it's very helpful to have people uh, who know all the trainings and things like that in the VA who can transcribe for us. And um, I think that is all I have, and I'm going to turn it over to Kenda, who is one of our PhD anthropologists here. Thanks, Heather. Um, my name is Kenda Stewart, and I have been working with Cadre's Qualitative Corps in the Department of Veterans Affairs for four years. I completed my PhD in cultural anthropology in 2012 and immediately transitioned into my current position as a qualitative analyst. As an analyst, I provide methodological encoding or analytical expertise to mixed methods or qualitative research projects. To illustrate the role of a VA anthropologist qualitative analyst position on a mixed methods team, I'm going to share experiences from evaluating Dr. Katz's inpatient smoking cessation intervention. Next, I will provide a brief description of the historical, political, and cultural background of smoking in VA. The purpose of this presentation is to demonstrate a concrete example of anthropology's role in understanding and evaluating an intervention implemented in VA hospitals. The intervention was based on the chronic care model and included enhanced training for nurses to promote the use of the five A's framework to support smoking cessation counseling provided to patients during their hospitalization. The five A's represent a model for behavioral change and stands for ask, advise, assess, assist, and arrange. In addition to providing counseling, nurses were supported through a structured algorithm in CPRS, which is the VA's electronic medical record system. This led them through the 5 A's process as they spoke with the patient. Nurses were encouraged to ask about patients' readiness to quit, to advise patients to quit smoking by tailoring the message to the individual patient's health needs, to assess the patient's readiness to quit and maybe set a quit date, to assist the patient in quitting by offering nicotine replacement therapy such as the patch, medication, or gum, and to arrange by faxing a referral to the state's quit line that would follow up with patients via telephone. The counseling encounters were envisioned as brief and highly focused in order to be feasible for a nurse to complete on a busy VA inpatient ward, as well as digestible enough for a patient faced with a hospital stay. As others have found, hospitalization is an opportunity for staff to provide smoking cessation counseling because patients are in a smoke-free setting where they can receive care from professionals who are well-equipped to provide assistance in quitting. In the hospital, patients are away from the usual smoking cues and their current health crisis may serve as a wake-up call to quit. Yet, health services researchers have only found modest success in implementing smoking cessation guidelines in the VA inpatient setting. While this intervention focused on changing nurses' practice behaviors to be more concordant with national smoking cessation guidelines, ethnographic observations and feedback from staff indicated that the roots of the smoking problem were more deeply ingrained in the culture of VA. Tobacco use and related policies have a long history within the U.S. military and VA. During World War I and continuing until 1975, cigarettes were included in soldiers' rations and tobacco products were sold on VA premises. Tobacco use became a rite of passage for incoming recruits as manifested by the increasing rates of tobacco use ever after young people entered the military. In response to mounting evidence of the negative effect of smoking on physical fitness and health, the Secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs initiated a no-smoking policy at all VA facilities in 1990. In response to protests from a veterans lobby supported by the tobacco industry, Congress weakened this policy when it passed the Veterans Health Care Act of 1992, requiring VA facilities provide public smoking areas or smoke shacks for veterans and hospital staff. 
Smith and colleagues have found that while the military and VA do not hesitate to regulate other behaviors, tobacco control policies are, quote, considered a threat to smokers' rights, end quote. This phenomenon is referred to as tobacco exceptionalism. So this is, or this was the overarching context in which the intervention was implemented. Each of the four VA hospitals involved in the intervention had a designated smoking area, only one of which was actually inside the hospital. Patients targeted were those admitted to general medical wards. To get a sense of how well the intervention worked, we used a mixed methods approach. In addition to surveying patients and nurses about their use of the five A's framework, we included a qualitative component which involved field visits to each of the four sites, facilitating early intervention focus groups and conducting interviews with a purposeful sample of nurses. This diagram shows how we integrated quantitative and qualitative sampling and data collection. Nurses were given a decisional balance questionnaire which is a questionnaire divided into 10 items that reflect positive attitudes or pros and 10 items that reflect negative attitudes or cons toward providing inpatient smoking cessation counseling. In addition to these results being analyzed quantitatively, we also used the results to divide nurses into four quadrants at each of the four sites, pro-pro, pro-con, con-pro, and con-con. Within each quadrant, we interviewed two nurses who were available to be interviewed during our site visits, which resulted in a total of eight nurse interviews per site. At one site, we ended up interviewing an extra nurse due to scheduling. This sampling strategy also allowed us to look at the coded interviews by nurse quadrant to see if any themes emerged according to their decisional balance questionnaire responses. Interviewing nurses on the inpatient ward required specific considerations. First, conducting interviews face-to-face -face presented logistical challenges as we were traveling from out of state and had to match our schedules with those of potential interviewees as closely as possible. Working with the site coordinator, we were able to obtain rough shift schedules for the nurses we were trying to target. Prior to our arrival, nurses had consented to doing an interview that did not have a specific appointment. Therefore, we had to recruit nurses based on availability once we arrived on the ward. In order to be most successful at this, we considered the times during a shift that a nurse could potentially be less busy. We avoided shift changes, meal times, times for passing out medications. Instead, we found that early afternoon, early evening, and the wee hours of the morning were the best times. Most importantly, we were able to wait until the nurse was ready, and we made it clear that we did not want to interrupt patient care. Once a nurse was available to be interviewed on some wards, we did have trouble finding a suitable place to talk. We mostly interviewed nurses in waiting rooms and break rooms. An unforeseen advantage of interviewing in break rooms was the opportunity for nurses to jump in on the conversation, which helped to provide more information about the specific context and culture of the ward and medical center. The flexibility and tenacity required to conduct interviews on an inpatient ward was not completely foreign for the anthropologists on the project, as it resembles the hanging out often required at our field sites. Waiting also gave us time to unobtrusively absorb and observe our surroundings at each hospital. Being able to speak one-on-one -on -one with nurses, in addition to observing their work environment, added a layer of context and meaning to the evaluation of the intervention that could not be grasped by quantitative data alone. For instance, an overarching theme in interviews across sites was that the existence of a smoke shack or shelter at each hospital created a physical and mental barrier for nurses trying to convince their patients to quit smoking. Nurse interviews also indicated a general perception of veterans as most likely being smokers or former smokers who are set in their ways or had been through too much already to quit smoking now. Rather than negating the quantitative data, these data develop a more complex picture of why the intervention was adopted in the way it was. Now Dr. David Katz will discuss the evaluation of the intervention in more detail as he shares the lessons we learned as a mixed methods research team employing the tools of health service research and anthropology. But just before you get started, we have another poll question. Have any of you collaborated in health services research projects?
All right, it looks like there's two or three of the, the people here. Uh, so it's not bad. I'll, I'll follow up with those specific people uh, for questions. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm a, a general internist and health services researcher. Um, after a residency in internal medicine, I completed a BA fellowship in clinical research and then a master's degree in clinical epidemiology. I've led several implementation research projects over the past 15 years, and we'll talk about some of the challenges and opportunities in collaborating with anthropologists. Just trying to, oh, there we go. So first of all, uh, the rationale for implementation research is that many interventions found to be effective in health services research studies fail to translate into improved patient outcomes. Barriers to implementation may arise at multiple levels of healthcare delivery, at the uh, patient level, provider level, organizational level, and at the health policy level. And the barriers vary across different practice settings and contexts. Health services researchers need to conduct formative evaluation to assess the extent to which a given implementation strategy is effective in a specific context to prolong sustainability of the intervention and to promote dissemination of findings to other practice settings. Toward this end, the Veterans Health Administration established the Quality Enhancement Research Initiative in 1998 to systematically implement clinical research findings and evidence-based recommendations into routine clinical practice. Anthropologists offer a unique perspective in understanding implementation of evidence-based medicine. They can provide deeper understanding of contextual factors that impede or facilitate implementation. They can provide an understanding of participants' beliefs and attitudes and a better appreciation of the social norms and culture of the medical ecosystem. Dr. Stewart briefly described the sampling and data collection strategy for the qualitative component of the VA BEST trial, which was a quasi-experimental pre-post trial in smokers who were hospitalized on the medicine units of four VA hospitals between May 2009 and December 2012. The first aim of this project was to, was to determine the effectiveness of a nurse-initiated intervention, uh, which coupled low-intensity inpatient counseling with sustained proactive telephone counseling, and we assessed this primarily uh, via patient survey. The second aim was to determine the impact of the intervention on nurses' attitudes and self-efficacy uh, for providing cessation counseling. And we uh, collected this information via staff survey. The third aim was to identify barriers and facilitators to implementation of cessation guidelines in VA hospitals uh, using qualitative methods, uh, specifically focus groups and in-depth interviews, and I'm going to focus on this last aim for, my, for the remainder of my talk. So uh, this trial included both a formative evaluation and a summative evaluation, and is best described as a multi-phase mixed methods design. With regard to the formative evaluation, we conducted a focus group at each site approximately halfway during the intervention period. <clears throat> In the focus group, we asked participants to describe the local smoking cessation practices and the smoking culture. We asked them to identify barriers to changing cessation practices and to suggest strategies that would facilitate change at the facility. Summaries of the focus groups were designed to guide adaptation of the intervention to the local context. Each focus group included a nurse, nurse manager, medicine resident, attending physician, pharmacist, 
and or a substance abuse counselor so that we could obtain input regarding to tobacco treatment from key players on the inpatient unit. With regard to summative evaluation, we uh, elicited stories from the nurses in an effort to capture how the intervention was implemented in practice. We asked about the usefulness of the intervention, facilitators and barriers to implementing the intervention, their intentions to use the intervention in the future, and suggestions for further refinements. Our intent was to use the qualitative interviews to explore and make sense of the quantitative results. As the PI, there are several, several lessons that I learned from this project that I'd like to share with you. Uh, first, you need to include the inclusive of the study design. Rather than developing qualitative component of the study separately, which is what happened in this project. Although, of course, there are many uh, designs that do involve more separate, uh, more of a concurrent uh, mixed methods uh, design. Uh, you also need to provide adequate resources for, for the qualitative team, including the cost of transcription, recording equipment and software, transportation, and so forth. And you need to engage members of the qualitative team up front in thinking about the conceptual framework for implementation. The second lesson pertained to the assessment of reliability. While both myself and my anthropology colleagues agreed on the need to assess inter-rater reliability during the coding process, we had differing understandings of what this entailed. In epidemiology, we often use the CAPA statistic to measure the degree of agreement between two or more coders who make independent ratings about the presence or absence of a particular finding in a set of subjects above and beyond the role of chance. In qualitative research, percent agreement between coders is commonly used. Here, percent agreement refers to an exact match in the code selected for a particular set of transcripts. This is an iterative process in which the discrepancies in coding were discussed uh, until reaching consensus, and then we later rechecked inter-rater agreement, aiming for a target of at least 80% agreement. We went back and forth on this uh, during the study, but ultimately decided to report percent agreement. The third lesson was that formative evaluation requires a deep understanding of the phenomenon being evaluated. We started with an initial theory of care delivery for tobacco treatment based on the five A's framework and the chronic care model, but this didn't really help much in understanding our data. We, we used a purely inductive approach initially. This allowed us to identify two to three overarching themes barriers related to daily workload and inpatient logistics, personal attitudes towards smoking and tobacco treatment in the VA, and elements of the intervention that were felt to be useful in providing cessation counseling. But this still did not tell us the whole story or capture the richness of our data. So after a lot of discussion, we decided to use an existing theory, uh, which I refer to as the knowledge attitudes behavior framework to synthesize our findings. And this allowed us to more readily communicate our results using the language of implementation science, and it allowed us to better integrate our quantitative and qualitative data. The fourth lesson relates to reporting of the data. We initially had differing views on the value of reporting the frequency of major codes. The, med the medical literature often includes quantitative measures of qualitative data, such as a frequency table of specific codes. In the end, we decided not to include a frequency table, but rather to provide a narrative summary of the major themes. The frequencies of specific codes were felt to be largely driven by the interviewer's guide and did not really reflect the spontaneous utterances of our subjects.
As a non-anthropologist, I learned to uh, trust but verify. I needed to be receptive to alternative paradigms for research and to learn more about qualitative research in particular. I also needed to ensure progress toward the qualitative aim of the study and to keep our group on task. And this was a challenge uh, on account of major turnover of the qualitative staff during this project. I also recommend that PIs get more involved in the process. For this project, I read interviews, helped to develop the coding guide, and helped in the synthesis of interview data. I also helped to ground the analysis conceptually because of my interest in uh, smoking cessation and my understanding of how to apply what we learned in clinical practice. This in turn allowed me to oversee the quality of data collection and analysis. The last lesson is the need to develop a strategy for mixed methods analysis up front. As I mentioned previously, the original proposal focused uh, on separate collection of quantitative and qualitative data, uh, which uh, we realized was not optimal. Uh, it can be very difficult to develop an analysis plan for integrating quantitative and qualitative findings after the data are already collected. In conclusion, I hope that you can learn from our experience as you develop collaborative projects with implementation researchers and that you'll be aware of some of the common issues that need to be negotiated with your health service research colleagues. Thanks. And we'll, we'll entertain any questions uh, that, that you all might have. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, thank you guys very much. Uh, we are open for questions, so feel free to submit them in the chat or Q&A tab. Um, starting out, uh, I would be interested to hear if you guys have any consideration. I, I've seen, uh, obviously not these kind of projects, but uh, similar projects done in uh, non-governmentally based hospitals. And I was wondering if you had any insight into differences uh, in, in you know, doing something for the government versus something for a, a private um, hospital. Um, this is Heather, and um, I mean, one thing would be that I'm guessing that a lot of that research is actually federally funded, um, even if it's in a private or academic medical center, um, but still is considered health services research. Um, so in that sense, um, it is still linked federally, I guess. Um, and, and then as far as the difference between the two, I think one of the things I like about being a VA anthropologist is that we are integrated into the larger healthcare system. So often um, our research is, um, I guess, doesn't just kind of go into the black box. Uh, that I feel like a lot of times when we do research in other settings um, happens, I guess. And so in the VA, you often work with policy makers, administrators, et cetera, while you're also doing the research. So that part I like. Um, the VA, like I mentioned, does have a lot of data security and um, regulatory issues that aren't always very fun to deal with. but. So I don't know if you have something to add, David. I know you and I differ on liking to work with policymakers, but sometimes. Well, the only, the only thing that uh, that I would add is that um, if you're trying to do this type of research, uh, it really helps to have um, uh, a, uh, a larger group, a center with adequate infrastructure. Uh, so uh, I can tell you that in the uh, on a prior project uh, outside of the VA, uh, I had to really cobble together a qualitative research team and we had really very little, um, we, we really didn't have uh, the kind of uh, infrastructure needed to do a, a, 
to do a first-rate uh, evaluation. And uh, also, I think just simply getting access uh, to uh, the subjects outside of the VA uh, can sometimes be more challenging. But, you know, again, that depends on having a good operational partners, regardless of whether you're uh, within uh, in the private sector or, or within the VA. Great. Thank, thank you, guys. Um, that's a good question. And the answers. Uh, now, let's see. Um, Andrea asks, uh, did any of the VA staff smoke? Were you able to recruit staff who smoked for interviews and FGs? I'm sorry, can you repeat the last half of that question? Sure, sorry. Um, did any of the VA staff smoke? And were you able to recruit staff who smoked for interviews and FGs? Um, so, yes, some of us did smoke. And that does, I mean, to be honest, that does help you relate to what some of the folks are going through, particularly on a patient's preferences study that we've been involved in where we are interviewing veterans about their preference for quitting. And we also interviewed staff who smoke, and that was one of the things that came up uh, repeatedly in the interviews from smokers and non-smokers as a potential barrier to, give, to convincing patients to quit. Because if you're a smoker, you know, how do you do that? There's pros and cons. So a smoker might be able to better relate or a smoker may not take it as seriously. Who knows? I mean, we heard different things. Um, yeah. I would uh, just add that uh, uh, I think uh, this, we were concerned, uh, perhaps, that we would not get as much uh, participation uh, from uh, uh, staff who were smokers, uh, but uh, we found that they were very receptive uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to participating in the interviews and uh, also gave us some uh, unique insights. All right. Yeah, um, let's see. Uh, Laura asks uh, if you, uh, if there's any advice for developing collaboration with VA, MC, or other VA facilities from scratch. Uh, she says, I am starting a, a faculty position in the Northeast. I would love to build on previous experiences with research contracts as a postdoc in the South, but not sure where or how to start. So um, I would start by going on, um, doing a Google search for the AHS R&D website, and then there are uh, centers of innovation, which are called COINS, um, and if you can look at which uh, VA medical centers have a COIN um, and contact the director, or if you can tell whether there's a qualitative researcher at that site. Um, contacting them, and so then you can really see uh, regionally who has research going on. You can also look um, actually at the rehabilitation uh, research centers too, although not sure about any in the north. Uh, where are you at? Northeast. Yeah, I'm not sure, but as far as um, the medical centers through health services research and development, there are several. And this is a good starting point. Um, I don't know if, if you guys uh, would be able to answer this, but um, we had we had people from the uh, National Park Service uh, a little while ago. Uh, on uh, the webinar, and I was wondering if uh, the main way to get involved in these kind of projects, um, is it through USA Jobs or is there uh, another um, place that might be a better suited uh, avenue? Um, so USA Jobs is definitely a place uh, to start looking if you're looking for a position um, in the VA. Um, like Laura 
talked about. There are contracts as well, so that would probably be outside of um, actually USA Jobs, but specifically a medical center or different research institution that was awarded a contract. Um, I think probably the best way to try to find a job in the VA is to actually contact one of the research centers that you're interested in working with and um, see if they have any grants or um, work going on in qualitative research um, that they're interested in bringing you on for. And then they can help you actually navigate the USA job system. This is a little out of sequence, but uh, I, just, I just thought of another uh, a potential way to make contact with um, VA researchers. This is in response to Laura's question. And that is uh, uh, contact uh, the uh, local VA, uh, particularly if there is a health services research group or COIN, uh, and invite to, to present your own research. Uh, and that may uh, sometimes generate uh, uh, potential uh, collaboration. Yeah, that's a good point. Interesting. Yeah. Um, it looks as though uh, no one else is uh, sending any, any questions. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, now is the time to ask. Um, I think we've covered everything. Um, there were a couple of people that asked if they could follow up with you guys uh, through email. Um, I don't know if you... Um, there's a, a singular email uh, that would be best to send um, questions to directly or? Um, sure, they can send them to any of us and we should have put a slide with our um, email addresses on there and didn't think about that. Okay. Um, but for all of us, um, well, it's um, our first name, our dot last name at va.gov. So heather.reesinger at va.gov. Sounds I'm, good. I'm going, I'm, I, was just gonna, I was just going to add that uh, uh, the best way to reach me is uh, through my University of Iowa email address, which is david-katz at uiowa.edu. And I can be reached at kenda.stewart at va.gov. Great, and I'll, I'll collect all the emails um, that they're, the people who are requesting and I'll, I'll send them along just in case as well. Great, um, thank you. But yeah, so it looks so, uh, oh, here we go. I'm sorry, there was one more question. Oh, no, that, that's a question for me. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, so I think that about wraps it up, uh, unless you guys have any uh, closing comments. No, I don't think so. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I know all of us enjoy our jobs, so it's fun to be able to share this with other anthropologists. Yeah, no, it, uh, it's, uh, this was a great webinar. I'm glad you guys uh, could join us. And we do want to thank David for um, being willing to talk about his experience working with uh, VA anthropologists, and um, it was really great to uh, learn his lessons as well to kind of help us as we continue to work with health services researchers. So thank you, David. My pleasure. All right, and uh, just a, a few housekeeping notes. Um, there is a survey uh, at the end of this, um, this webinar. It, it does help us improve and we're always looking to make a better experience for everyone involved. So please do fill that out. And if you uh, enjoy this webinar series, uh, we'll have another one in two weeks time with uh, Larissa Sandy exploring uh, sex work in Cambodia. Uh, so that should be a good one. And that will be actually the last one of the spring. So definitely check in for that. Um, the recording will be up. Uh, Hopefully by Friday, I'm going to try and uh, tweak the sound a little bit so we get a better sound quality. But the slides will be up uh, as well with that. And you can find it on our website or on our YouTube channel. 
Uh, so do check that out. And uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank Kenda, you. Heather and David. Yep. And uh, thank you attendees. And have a great rest of your day. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you.